Here's your California and Anthem Blue Cross. Our goals for today are to define opioids and how they impact the adolescent brain and adolescent behavior, to understand trends in U.S. and California opioid use, including addiction, overdose, and death, to understand risk factors for opioid use, opioid addiction, and other substance abuse disorders, and to understand the role of educators and healthcare providers in addressing the adolescent opioid crisis. A few housekeeping items before we get started today. If you have not already um, called in, this is the phone number to call in as well as the access code. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website after the presentation and the PowerPoint will also be posted on our website. Another thing to note is that you are all muted for the presentation. If you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box and we'll be able to respond to them accordingly. Today we are joined by Albert Hassan. Um, he received his MSW from UCLA and has worked in the field of addiction medicine as a researcher and a treatment provider since 1977. Mr. Hassan was an administrative director of the Matrix Institute and board chairman from 1993 to 2005. Mr. Hassan has extensive experience in providing cognitive behavioral therapy and as the node coordinator of the Pacific Region node of the NIDA Clinical Trials Network he conducted clinical trials using, med using medications and behavioral therapies for substance use disorders. He now serves as a project director and trainer at UCLA ISAP. Before I pass um, the presentation off to him, I'm just going to give a brief overview of the California School-Based Health Alliance. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. Uh, you'll see a link to our website on the PowerPoint. This is also where the webinar recording and PowerPoint slides will be available after the presentation. I also want to take a moment to share um, that we have a membership. This membership includes co a conference registration discount. I'll speak a little bit more about our conference at the end of this presentation. It also offers tools and resources that are only available to members. If you are interested in joining, the link to sign up is, is on the webpage. And without further ado, I am going to go ahead and pass this presentation off to Al. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. All right. Wonderful. So I, I, I too want to thank the School-Based Health, Health Alliance and the Opioid Response Network as well as your California and Anthem Blue Cross for um, allowing me to be here today and to share some information uh, regarding the uh, opioid epidemic and crisis in the United States. Um, so the, the Opioid Response Network is, is really available to assist um, uh, state targeted response technical assistance or grantees uh, to get information and technical assistance regarding uh, the evidence-based treatments, prevention, treatment, and um, recovery for opioid use disorders. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the Opioid Response Network, it provides consultants such as myself, uh, to come out to organizations or to um, deliver information uh, via via webinar as as we are doing today. And here's some, if you have you know if you'd like to get some technical technical assistance locally, um, here's some uh, access numbers that you can contact or you can visit the uh, the ORN website uh, as well. If if you can't get get uh, you know, information through them, you're, you're welcome to have, uh, you know, contact me and I'll link you with, uh, with MOMTA here locally at, uh, at UCLA. So what we're really going to talk about today are opioids. Um, we're going to touch briefly upon the neurobiology of, of, of addiction. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, what they are, what they do, sort of what their value is and, and how they've been used sort of, you know, across the board in society why it matters to us and, and certainly if you, if you haven't been paying attention to the news over the last uh, five to seven years or so, um, uh, then, then you might have missed it. But what we're seeing is a, a huge increase in terms of uh, overdose, overdose deaths, 
increased vulnerability. We're going to talk about those risk factors. Who's using them right now, specifically some of the youth and, and, and how, they're, how they're gaining access to it, and, and really what we're, what we're looking to do as it relates to, uh, to the opioid epidemic. And this is one of those things, is getting information out to the people um, that it matters most to. Uh, we've done a tremendous job when it comes to smoking cessation by getting the word out to, to youth and you know, and, and talk about the, the ills and the, the challenges that people face when they do smoking and, you know, when they, when they smoke cigarettes and, and tobacco. And, and we did a tremendous job right up until the time, you know, with that and cutting, cutting back and reducing the impact that, that tobacco products have had. Uh, we're facing some different challenges now as it relates to, to, to vaping and, and things of that nature. Now, Addiction, you know, we talk about addiction as a brain disease, and, and you know, it hasn't always been that way. Um, it's, it's moreover, uh, it was Alan Leshner, the then director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, who really sort of pioneered the understanding that it's a chronic relapsing brain disorder, uh, that it's characterized by compulsive drug seeking, um, and that it impacts an individual, uh, their family, uh, and, and as well as the community. It's, it's long been considered a moral failing, you know, or a character flaw, uh, that it's a criminal justice matter or a lack of willpower. And, and, and through science, what we've come to realize and what we've come to understand is that it's not those things, but rather what it ends up doing is changing the way people think. It changes their brain function. So when we talk about why people take drugs, you know, um, certainly what, what we know is that, is that, you know, it makes us feel good. Certain drugs really make us feel good. You know, drugs and alcohol, there's a social currency to that. You know, and, you know, when we begin to, you know, experiment, what we find out is that, hey, you know, there's other people around who, who like, to, like to party as well, and that social currency really becomes valuable, you know, that discussion on Monday after, you know, having gone to the football game and partied and seeing how, you know, uh, you know how much fun we have or how sick somebody got and making fun of them. Additionally, what we, what we end up is we, we take drugs to make us feel better, you know, to reduce our anxiety, you know, some, sometimes social anxiety, you know, especially young people, you know, communicating with other young individuals, sometimes drinking some alcohol or smoking pot, seems to make it, it, it less sensitive, less anxious. Uh, it reduces our, our fears, our depression, our hopelessness, but certainly those are only transitional changes that are made as a result of the drugs. And, and of course, when we experience withdrawal, it causes us really to, to, take, on, um, to, to take on more drugs. And how this is done, how this is accomplished, is, is through the dopamine system. Whether we eat food or have physical contact with an individual, whether or not we're taking drugs, it causes a release of dopamine on our system. And what we're gonna see in the next couple slides is really the impact that, do that, that, that substances have, uh, including food, on our dopamine system. This is some work that we've done with, uh, with, with rats by uh, Deshara and his colleagues. And what you see is they, um, if you look at the, uh, the, the little graph on the left, and it, it shows, um, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor there, but uh, basically it shows that in a, in a resting state, the rats had about 100 units of, of dopamine available. When they're introduced, when, and when they're able to feed, it spikes up to 150. Uh, similarly, on the right side, when there's a female introduced into the, the rat cage and they have a little rat sex or whatever they do, um, you can see that there's a spike in dopamine from a uh, resting state of about 100 to, to 200. So imagine what substances do. And so you don't really have to imagine because we can see here. If you look on the right side, co cocaine, when, when administered uh, to these, these rats, it, it produces a spike in dopamine that is many, many times, well, that it's, it's significantly more than what we see with cocaine. Morphine, and you see on the, on the lower right, morphine um, 
uh, is, is dose dependent. So the more morphine that's administered, the greater the dopamine release. Nicotine, so, you know, something that, that happens on a regular basis. People, when they, when they smoke cigarettes, they're, they're introducing uh, nicotine uh, on, a, on a fairly regular basis, and you can see there's a huge spike in dopamine. Now, when we talk about amphetamines, if you take a look at that, it's well over 1,000 units of dopamine that's released many, many times more what we see as it relates to sex or cocaine or, or, cocaine or morphine or food that matter, and, you know, for, for that matter. So you can see that it's incredibly pleasurable for people. They enjoy the feeling, and that's really what draws them back. Now, how we know this information is through really the, the, the science, the neurobiology of addiction, either through MRI scans or PET scans there in the middle or functional MRI. And, and this, these advances in neuroimaging really have shown that it, it's, it's not just powerful drugs that can cause compulsive use, but other things such as gambling, um, sex, gaming, shopping, they also produce uh, spikes in dopamine. The PET scan is used to show changes in, you know, following chronic drug abuse, right, during withdrawal from use, and also the experience of drug craving. And what we've come to find out is that drug craving and, and, and how we've been able to monitor drug craving in the brain is almost as powerful as what the drug produces itself. So, you know, when you think about your favorite dessert, I don't know, maybe it's molten chocolate cake, right? You know, when that center is nice and hot and you got some whipped cream on the top of it, man, what happens? Well, you know, you begin to salivate and you begin to think of that. And, you know, if you hadn't already eaten lunch, maybe you might include some dessert in your lunch when you go out. So those are some of the things that really happen to, you know, in terms of driving craving. And they change the, diet, the, the, the DSM manual to include craving because it's a significant part of the process of, of, of drug use as well as rehabilitation. When we look at the brain regions involved in substance use, there's, there's three primary reasons that we look at uh, regions. The basal ganglia really controls rewarding or pres pleasurable, I'm sorry about that, pleasurable effects of substance use. And they're responsible for those, you know, um, the, the formation of habitual substance taking. The extended amygdala, amygdala is involved in stress and feelings of unease, anxiety, irritability that typically accompanies substance use, uh, or I should say substance withdrawal. So when people feel uncomfortable, right, it's really generated from the extended amygdala, you know, especially after they've been using substances for a while. And when they use, that sort of gets tempered and they feel better. But it's only transient. It's only for a short period of time. And then when we look at the prefrontal cortex, what we know about the prefrontal cortex is it's, it's involved in, you know, in, in sort of the, the executive function, our ability to organize our thoughts and activities, prioritize our tasks and, and, and making decisions. And that gets impacted severely as well. Now this next slide shows that really the, sort of the progression of, of addiction as a brain disorder. An individual might start you know, binging, they might start using, it has a significant impact on the basal ganglia. Um, and what ends up happening is things that used to be rewarding you know, it just aren't so rewarding anymore. Hanging out with friends, going bowling, going to the dances, you know, that, that just doesn't have the same sort of salience. It doesn't have the same value anymore, especially when we've introduced substances, right? Then what ends up happening after we've done that, after we've used for a significant period of time, we begin to crave, actually. And that craving is really generated in that prefrontal cortex. It's, you know, we begin to think that, you know, our friends aren't so valuable anymore going to work or getting good grades in school. You know, it impacts our decision-making process. And then there's the withdrawal symptoms, anxiety and agitation and excessive stress. You know, withdrawal symptoms, generally what, one of the things that we talk about when we talk about withdrawal symptoms are the physical withdrawal. 
But really, when it comes to opioid use and when it comes to, you know, to opioid dependence, really one of those driving factors is, is the panic, is the psychological stress that people undergo when they're trying to stop. And, and, and it really it drives them to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do. So we know that addiction is a chronic uh, you know, brain disorder. Um, we've seen that through PET scans. And as you see here in some of the PET scans that we have, it really what we're showing is diseased organs. And we don't usually think of our brain as a diseased organ, you know, like we might think of the liver or the heart or other, other parts of our body. But in reality, what we're showing here is on the left side is that of a healthy brain. The utilization of glucose and dopamine, uh, dopamine activity, uh, you know, at at at, uh, at the at the receptors there. If you take a look on the right side, the diseased brain. That's a brain of of a, a cocaine abuser, and you can see there's a lot less activity going on. Now, if we relate that to heart disease, on the on the left side, you see a healthy heart. You see all the activity going on. And then on the right side, you see the diseased heart. And it's, it's, it really, um, it, it's an inability to fuel the system uh, or fuel the necessary functions, basically, of that, organ, of that organ. Now, let's take a look at a few more slides here. And, I, you know, dopamine regulates uh, emotional and, and, and motivational behavior. Um, and so one reason it's really difficult to maintain abstinence for people is that they're required to make repeated decisions in a relatively short period of time to use or to not use. And the more often that they have to make that decision, the less likely that they're to make it in the right way. Decisional fatigue really comes into play. And, and I think it sometimes, you know, that happens with people shopping, with, you know, when we go grocery shopping, you know, we're inundated with different things that are, that are expressly planted throughout the grocery store. There's a reason why they have those magazines and all the candy and the gum, you know, right at the checkout stand, because they want you to wait long, and then you're looking at that and goes, boy, don't those M&Ms look really good about this point in time. I always fall prey to those sorts of things. When we look at vulnerability to addiction, okay, it differs from person to person. And, you know, why do some people become addicted while other people don't? I mean, I, I, you know, I, I have friends who, you know, if you give them a really nice glass of wine, they're going to take a sip and they're going to be done for the day. That's it. They don't want any more. They're satiated. And at the same time, I have other friends who, you know, look at that person's glass of wine and say, hey, you're going to finish that? And, you know, the person says no and says, oh, I'll take it off your hands for you then, right? But what we know is that about 40 to 60 percent of vulnerability to alcohol, tobacco, and, and the illicit substances really are genetic influences. And they, they, they know that through, through genetic studies and, and tracking. It's not just a brain disease, okay? Even though we want you to be, we, you know, certainly it is a brain disease, but not just a brain disease. That vulnerability differs from person to person. So we start out with the genetic factors, right? But there are other things that go along with that, environmental factors. You know, if substances aren't available when you're growing up, then, then you're not gonna be exposed to them. If you don't have people around you you know, older siblings or parents or, uh, or, or older friends or younger friends, for that matter, using substances, uh, it might not be the case. Some, some, you know, some neighborhoods, you know, there's, there's a, you know, a liquor store on every single corner. And so it, it seems like it's, it's natural, pro, you know, progression uh, to, to, to drink. Um, and so there are a lot of things that increase an individual's vulnerability, and they include the genetics. A person's gender, mental, you know, mental health. You know, what we know is individuals with serious mental illness are more likely to, to smoke tobacco, more likely to use, uh, you know, drink alcohol or to use other substances. And then the environment. There are protective factors, but there's also, you know, uh, trauma, you know, whether, uh, you know, what, what uh, the parents' attitudes are, you know, in, in relation to that, what the community attitudes are. How engaged is somebody in, in sports or school, uh, you know, a activities? 
And then the drug itself. The earlier a person use, the greater the, uses, the greater the likelihood that they are to develop a substance use disorder uh, as, a, as an adult. Root of administration, are they smoking it? Are they injecting it? Are they taking it in pill form? And then the individual variation that comes into that. So there's a lot of things that go into, into play with that, one of which is perception, perceived risk. And what we know right now is perceived risk of cannabis. Let's just talk about cannabis. Perceived risk of cannabis is as low as it's been in about 30 years. And what we see now is that use is escalating. And it's escalating in, in uh, you know, especially in areas like here in California, in Washington State, in Colorado, where it's been, uh, you know, app approved for, um, uh, for sale for uh, so why can't people just stop using? Well, you know, what ends up happening is that, you know, our value system changes, our ability to make decisions changes when we started to use, um, our risk-taking uh, increases as well, and, and all of these things are severely, severely impacted. And so what motivated us before, getting good grades, doing well and, you know, uh, impressing our, our family, impressing our family and uh, our friends, working hard, those vocational, educational pursuits, those are all compromised and those are no longer of value. And what our brain sees as a value is that spike, that huge spike in dopamine. But something happens and what ends up happening is that that our use goes from voluntary when we make the decision oh i just want to I, I you know i just want to go out and have some fun with our friends and you know that might be on a friday night and before too long that spills into saturday night and sunday morning and then and then every once in a while oh well, maybe we'll do it during during the week and so what ends up happening is that it's it's really considered the way the uh the uh American Society of Addiction Medicine considers it or defines it is it's a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation and memory related to circuitry, related the way our, our brain actually functions. And, and it's really the dysfunction in, in, in these circuits that lead to the biological, the psychological, um, and, and the pursuit of substance use um, to the, to the demise of other parts of our life, to our relationships, our health, our employment, as well as our education. So, um, opioids. Let's talk a little bit about you know, op opioids and, and, and what they are uh, briefly. So what you have in the top left-hand corner is you have some uh, opium uh, in, its, in its rare form. You have powdered heroin. It's usually what you see on the East Coast. You have the tar heroin right below that. That's what we see on the, you know, on the West Coast. And when I say West, it's Mississippi is the dividing line. There's, there's OxyContin and fentanyl. You, you hear about fentanyl. Fentanyl is really responsible for the third wave of all the overdose deaths that we're seeing nationwide. And it's not just in, in people who are using opioids such as heroin, but rather what we're seeing it is mixed in with other, other substances, stimulants, including uh, amphetamine, methamphetamine, as well as, as, as well as cocaine. So opioids. So if, if you call them all opioids, you're going to be, you're, you're going to be correct, okay? Um, it, it refers to opioid, opiates which are morphine and codeine, and derived compounds are synthetic opioids, such as heroin and, and buprenorphine, which is currently used to, to treat uh, opioid uh, uh, dependence, uh, and then the synthetics, like fentanyl and methadone. So if you refer to all of them as opioids, you're perfectly correct in, 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 in doing so. Now, in terms of what they do, um, well, really what they do is, is they really interrupt the signaling of pain uh, to our brain. And, and if you've ever broken a bone or, you know, it, it, it uh, twisted an ankle really bad or had some teeth extracted, you know that for, for most of us, opioids work really well to, to um, interrupt that signaling of pain. 
how you know their their route of administration. They can be injected or smoked. They can be taken you know intranasally, intrarectally, and there's also implantable versions you know uh, uh, versions of opioids. But but really, it's not just the pain signaling um, that that causes people to repeatedly administer opioids. But really what happens is there's a sense of well-being that people get. It makes you feel, you know, for the majority of people, it makes them feel really good. It makes them feel content. It's sort of like, you know, on a cold day, taking a nice warm blanket and wrapping up and sitting by the fire. It's that sort of thing that really draws people back. There's an initial rush of pleasure it slows down the way we think, our reaction time, um, and, and as well as our decision time. What they're looking at research-wise now, what's interesting is they're looking at opioids and developing painkillers that, that, that stop the pain signaling but don't produce that sense of well-being. So, and, and it would be great if we, if we had that. Some of the acute effects, and when we're talking acute effects, you know, really almost immediate and short-term effects is, you know, you can see here constipation, slowed, you know, slowed speech. Sometimes initially people get nauseated over it, and they actually have to, you know, to adapt the tolerance to that. And so slowed heart rate, really what ends up killing people, though, in the long run is the respiratory depression, is that if you take enough it stops your breathing, basically, and, 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 uh, and, and you die that way. That's really, now the, the long-term effects, really, there's, they impact several different organs. You know, obviously a fatal overdose, but uh, for those intravenous users, collapsed veins, um, respiratory problems, part of that, you know, uh, even if they don't smoke it, is all the impurities in the stuff that, uh, you know, in, in the stuff that they're, they're, they're injecting causes abscesses, liver disease, um, as well as it can, it can cause some uh, endocarditis and infection of the heart lining and, and, and the valves. So, I mean, ultimately, it's, it's going to catch up to you. What we look at in terms of opioid withdrawals, so it, it really depends on the, uh, on the substance and, and sort of um, how long the substance lasts, lasts in your system. All opioids, though, produce similar set of withdrawal symptoms when abruptly, you know, stopped. It, the, the, the challenge, though, is depending on the half-life or how long a, uh, a drug lasts in your system is when the onset of withdrawals will begin. So for short-acting opioids like heroin or oxycodone, uh, onset of withdrawal is about 6 to 12 hours. Usually it's at the, the time of the next administration. For long-acting opioids like methadone or, or buprenorphine, um, it could be about 36 to 48 hours. Now, what, what they say is that symptoms peak between 36 to 72 hours and they last about five days, but it's like the worst bout of flu that you've ever had. And if, if you could take something to take away that flu, my guess is that anybody that's in the midst of it would do that. And, and so that's really where that repeated administration comes in, where the panic comes in, and people do things, they sell things, they sell themselves, they steal things, that they, uh, they engage in behaviors that they otherwise wouldn't do unless they feel that, that, that sense. And here's some symptoms, you know, nausea and vomiting, the teary or running nose, muscle aches, incredible muscle aches and back pain, fever, sweating, and, and usually what ends up happening is this can persist for a significant period of time. So now that I give you a little bit of that, a little bit of overview, why do we care? And why do we care, you know, that, 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 that people who are, you know, engaging in criminal activities, that people who've done this to themselves, why do we care that, that we get resources to them? That's, that's, it's, an obvious, it's an obvious response. We've all been impacted in some ways by substance use, whether it's alcohol use or tobacco consumption or, or you know, opioids. We've all, we've all been impacted in many ways by this. So what we know is that most illicit drug use starts in adolescence. And as you can see by this graph here, um, this, is, this is a SAMHSA, um, this is the, the national survey. What we see is that 
drug use, you know, a, a small percent of people start between, you know, when, the, when they first enter um, the, their teens, a larger portion, you know, 14 to 16, uh, or 14 to 15, 16 to 17, you can see the percentage of, of new initiates uh, uh, throughout the total population, and that's on an annual basis. So it starts in adolescent with that experimentation. The longer we can keep people away from using, the longer we can get people um, to, to not initiate their initial drug use, the greater the likelihood we have that they won't ever develop a substance use disorder. As you can see, individuals who start between 21 and 25, I mean, there's, it, it's fewer and fewer onset, and those are the people that aren't developing the substance use disorder. So age at first use, uh, this is a little bit blurry, it's not just your eyes or, or mine for that matter, but age at first use is associated with risk of developing a, a substance use disorder. So at, when you're under age 18 and you begin to use a substance, you have a 25% risk of developing versus a 4% risk if you start after age 18. And so what I've told the younger members of my family is, like, if you're going to drink, if you're going to use anything, why don't you wait until you're 21? You know, and, and, you know, basically, I'm trying to just delay the onset because what we know is that the brain is still developing in these individuals, and they don't have that opportunity to, um, to develop those executive functions as they would if they waited and prolonged any, any sort of use. They call it a pediatric disorder, right? 90% of adults with any substance use disorder initiated the substance as a teen. And so, you know, when you, when you think about it and you, you think about, all right, so we just approved, you know, cannabis use here in, in, in California. And the perception right now of cannabis in California is, is that it's not a risky thing to do. And so what ends up happening is people start using it younger just the way they do tobacco and the way they do uh, alcohol, and it places them at risk. But additionally, adverse childhood experiences, right, they influence risk for a substance use disorder, neglect, drug use among parents, drug use among uh, uh, um, uh, other, other family members. And you can see the age of, on, you know, age of initiation. The earlier that somebody uses, the greater the likelihood that they are going to develop a substance use disorder. So the message that you're getting out to, to young people is really important. And if we can, if we can sort of in, in many ways duplicate the message that went out regarding tobacco cessation, right, that would be really good because we did an excellent job uh, on, 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 you know, helping people to recognize the potential risks of, of, uh, of using uh, uh, tobacco products. Nine of ten people who started substance use disorder started using in, you know, in, in adolescence, right? So about three-quarters, about 75% of the people, 18 to 30-year-olds, uh, admitted to treatment programs began using at the age of 17 or younger. So what, what we're seeing is that these people who are entering treatment now have had significant histories of, of, of using already, and that makes a huge challenge for treatment providers as well. Now, addiction, you know, when we talk about our stress response, now one of the things that drug use does is it impacts our ability to respond to stress. In a healthy brain, you know, cortisol is released, it spreads, spreads throughout our body, and when it reaches the brain, it, it sort of dampens, it puts a damp cloth on, on the stress, uh, stress response. In the addicted brain, what ends up happening is certain circuits, you know, turn off, and we don't handle stress nearly as well. And, and so things that might not really be that stressful when you're not using substances, all of a sudden become much more stressful when you're using substances. Just like our pain response, what the science shows that individuals who, um, who have not used substances have a much greater response and tolerance to pain. 
when you take individuals who've been using opioids for a significant period of time, their pain tolerance is much less, significantly less so than individuals who have never used. Same thing with stress. What we know is people under stress tend to drink, tend to smoke, tend to use drugs more often. It's Miller time, right? People get off work. You know, they've had a hard day at work, right? What are we going to do? We're going to go reward ourselves by reducing stress. And initially, yeah, you know, the, the alcohol causes a release of dopamine uh, it, 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 uh, it, and, and, and other neurotransmitters in, you know, in our brain, GABA for one, it, it helps us to settle down. But ultimately, in the long run, our stress response is, is impaired there. So what we know is that the interaction between the developing nervous system, right, it challenges our decision-making ability, right? It, 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 it challenges our understanding of what those long-term consequences of continued use are. People who start using young, they don't engage in you know, educational pursuits or, or vocational pursuits as, as to the same degree as individuals who don't. Um, and so what ends up happening is they lose sight of really what some of their goals are and have difficulty understanding those long-term challenges, and it increases our vulnerability to memory and attention deficits and that higher executive function in, in the individual. And so what ends up happening is we experiment more because it feels good, we like what it does, and, and really it leads to uh, creating a dependence, a substance use disorder. Now, in terms of risk factors, uh, there's a number of risk factors. Obtaining overlapping prescriptions, taking highly high doses, um, having a mental health uh, uh, illness uh, really contributes to that, and, and certainly living in poverty or low-income uh, areas are, are contributing factors. So when we look at serious mental illness, all right, so if you take a look at the, 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 the red line here, these are individuals 18 to 25. And, and you can see that um, basically individuals with serious mental illness um, uh, have a greater, there's a greater likelihood that they are going to use substances. All right? and, and we see that regardless of, of, of what age. So as the, the, the graphic shows here is that um, about a million and a half young adults with serious mental illness received treatment in 218, right? But half of those people didn't get treatment. It's going to be important for us to be able to treat mental illness as a way, as a mechanism to reduce the potential burden on the individual and on the system because what will end up happening is those individuals will begin to use substances as a way to manage their mental illness. In terms of major depressive episodes, what, we're, what we see in, in, in young people, this is the far left, um, what we see is about three, you know, in, in 2018, about uh, three and a half million uh, young people uh, endorsed or uh, uh, basically indicated that they've had major depressive episodes over the previous year. And, and, and again, what we know here, uh, moving on to that, major depressive episodes with se severe impairment among uh, adolescents in 2018, two and a half million people. So if we don't treat their mental illness, what's going to happen is they're going to treat it and they're gonna treat it with substances. Now, in terms of co-occurring issues, so substance use is more frequent among, you know, adults certainly with mental illness. And so untreated mental illness in adolescents, in, in youth, the transitional age youth, when they have an opportunity to become an adult, they're going to figure out ways to manage their mental illness. As you can, you can see, um, individuals with no mental illness are, are much less likely uh, to, to use substances, okay, uh, including marijuana, uh, which is the, the, if you look at the red lines, uh, 13 point, only 13.2% uh, use marijuana if they don't have a, a serious mental illness, fewer, yet fewer for opioids and prescription opioids there as well. So they, there's a connection. It's, it's rare that we don't see um, co-occurring disorders in, in, in adults in, uh, in, the, in the treatment setting. 
Now, when we look at the opioid epidemic by numbers, and, and one of the things that uh, I want I really want to point out here is, you know, there's a lot of information right now about the opioid epidemic really uh, sort of beginning to taper off. But what we do know is that people are still using. 107 in 2016, 170,000 new initiates to heroin the first time, 2.5 million individuals first used prescription opioids for the first time. So they're still coming into the system. And, and so our, our preventative efforts really aren't, aren't, that, aren't that good, to, to be completely on, honest with you. In terms of pre uh, pediatric opioid deaths and mortality rates by year, you can see still, uh, in 2016, it's pretty significant. It's not as high as it was in 2008, but it's still significant. And, and the majority of pres prescription opioid poisoning, the majority of these poisonings are from exposure to medications that were prescribed for a parent or an adult in the home. The majority of these are the result of medication prescribed by a parent or an adult at the home. So people are getting access to these from their own family members, right? And when we take a look at pediatric deaths from prescription and illicit opioids, right, um, the, uh, primarily what we see is the place of death is in the home, right? That's, that's where, and the manner of death is unintentional. That's uh, the, uh, so, so what, you know, people aren't going out of their way to find these things. They're found in the home, and they don't intend to harm themselves. Basically, what happens is it's, they're, they're, they're um, uh, unsupported. They, they have no idea or understanding of what these medications do, and they end up taking their own lives. And if you take a look at the, the age category, those age 15 to 19, there's almost 8,000 of those young people in, in 2018. And, and the younger yet, uh, when you look at zero to four, 605 children, you know, I mean, lost their lives um, uh, as a result of exposure to opioids. We can do something about this. We can train our parents to not leave these medications unattended and when they're, when they're, when they're through with them, uh, dispose of them through the proper methods, through like the, the, the DEA uh, drug take back days. Teen overdose deaths in, in the U.S. Uh, from uh, 99 to 2015, uh, you can see that that right now male uh, males really drive the drive the system, but females are are rapidly catching uh, are are rapidly catching up there. Okay, overdose in youth, tripling of deaths from twenty uh, from nineteen ninety nine to two thousand sixteen, and the largest increase we go back to that that previous graph are from ages fifteen to nineteen. And you know when you when you look at and you see the percent of students reporting non medical use of, of Vicodin, yeah, it's great that it's coming down. That's a really good thing that it's coming down. So the word is getting out, but yet we still have to pursue. We still have to continue to to, to talk to people about this. Now the reason that they misuse it is because it's easy to get. The number one item, it's easy to get from the medicine cabinet. It's available everywhere. So we're doing better about reducing our, the number of prescriptions out there, but we have to talk to parents. We have to talk to people about not leaving these medications, these poisons, out for young people to get. I've had a number of patients who, who you know, with the, um, the real estate boom, what they would end up doing is they would go to open houses. And the reason that they would go to open houses is because they knew that they could go into anybody's medicine cabinet and get the drug. And so the, we, have to, we have to do a better job on making such that these things aren't, aren't available. Um, and, and when we look at where pain relievers are obtained, most of the people are getting it from a friend or a relative, over 50%. It's not, people aren't doctor shopping. They're generally getting it, if you look at the, the, the blue uh, part of the pie chart there, 35% of it get it from one doctor. 
Uh, you have to go out of your way to get it through through multiple doctors, and, and now that we have a, a tracking system, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. But if you take a look at the majority of people are getting them in the house, that we can we can help that with education. All right, reasons for misuse. You know, generally people are using it, if you look under the pain reliever category, generally people are using it to relieve pain. However, with that said, a good portion are using it to relax or relieve tension, and another portion of it, almost 12%, are using it to get high, okay? So they're not using it for reasons that, uh, that they're really intended to use. So when we take a look at how did we get here? Well. Um, you know that pres prescriptions uh, have been, uh, you know, in 2012, um, there were about 260 million prescriptions written for, um, for opioids in, in the year. And, and, it's, and you take a look at the, the, the rapid overdose, they are directly related to the number of prescriptions, all right? Again, it, persons 12 or older, uh, past year use has gone up significantly with um, with the, 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 the number of prescriptions that have been written, as well as heroin overdoses have, have increased as a result. Now, this graph is one of my favorite graphs. In, in 2010, uh, what, what they did was they uh, uh, released abuse deterrent formulation of OxyContin, and that made it more difficult for it to be injected, right? So what happened is, people went from the, the blue line, they went from using OxyContin, they began, they shifted over to heroin. And what we see by the Cicero um, uh, research here is that 70% of the people who were using OxyContin shifted to using heroin. And that, that's, that, wasn't, that wasn't an accident. And, and so basically what ended up happening is we had three waves in opioid overdose deaths. Wave one really ran from 99 to about 2005. That was really the prescription overdoses, right? And then when people shifted, really, when there was a shift to, to using heroin, it was heroin. Right now, what we're seeing is the opioid overdose are really being driven by fentanyl and other synthetics. So what are we doing about it? Well, I mean, you know, one of the best things we're doing about it right now is we're talking about it. We're talking to young people about it, um, and 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 it's it's in the news. There there is information that's being provided. Uh, the CDC we have prescribing guidelines that are changing, educational in initiatives, the CARE Act. So there's a lot more money being put into prevention, being put into treatment as uh, as well. And I don't mean short term treatment, but extended treatment. We're making medications um, uh, available in terms of naloxone distribution so that we can overcome overdose, potential overdoses. And, and what it, what's happening now is doctors are prescribing naloxone with those patients that they're also prescribing opioids just in case um, somebody gets into trouble. Naloxone is the medication, is the antidote for an opioid overdose, all right? Law enforcement e efforts, you've seen that across the country, law enforcement efforts shutting down pill mills and, 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 uh, and now we're diverting people. Instead of putting them in jail, we're, we're treating these individuals. We're, we're sending them to drug courts so that they can get treatment. And, and also expansion of medications uh, to treat, uh, to, to treat ad uh, addiction, uh, opioid use disorder, including methadone, Suboxone or buprenorphine, as well as uh, uh, naltrexone and extended release naltrexone, and then the abuse deterrent. And so, what we're seeing, and this is a good thing, what we're seeing um, is that is that there is a reduction. Uh, fortunately, there is a reduction of opioid use in in the 18 to 25 year olds. Uh, in the 26 to, uh, uh, plus, but also the red line, if you take a look, in the 12 to 17. And those are significant reductions. However, we can't just live on our laurels. We have to keep driving and letting people know of the challenges that they face if they begin using substances. The FDA-approved medications include naltrexone and tablet in and, and an injectable form. The injectable form really helps to manage medication compliance. 
Methadone has been around for you know uh, about 45 or 50 years. It's it's uh, it's it's a very acceptable and and works. It's a, a evidence-based uh, medication. Buprenorphine has been around a little bit less, but what we know is that there are a number of formulations, including an implantable version that lasts six months, uh, a biodegradable 30-day injectable that you know that obviously lasts 30 days. Um, and then there's the tablet and the film. But also what we've seen over the years is exposure to buprenorphine through young people um, whose parents are taking it is a challenge. We need to teach those parents that they need to put this medication away out of the reach of young people so that they don't place themselves in harm's way. So naloxone, um, uh, I, I, I won't go into naloxone. It's uh, too much. It's a narcotic antagonist. Um, it it, it um, overrides the opioid effects. Adapt Pharma has done something really wonderful, and and they made it free uh, to high schools and colleges throughout the U.S. through um, a, a partnership with the, the the Clinton Foundation. So this is this is an antidote for overdose. Uh, and it, it, it just needs to be made available. And generally, you can get it without a prescription uh, at, a, at a local pharmacy. So what we know is, hey, look, opioids work. They, they kill pain. Um, you know, they, they, but what we also know is that prevention, getting the message out to young people, knowing what those risk factors are, knowing that opioids are treatable. It is a treatable illness. It's a treatable disease. It's a chronic disease, much in the same way that we see with, with asthma, um, much in the way we see with hypertension, as, as well as diabetes. And it's, it, it needs to be treated in that way so that it's not, you know, there, there, there isn't a completion. You're not done. You don't graduate from a program. This is something that you're going to have to manage generally over, over the, the, uh, the lifetime, over, over an individual's lifetime. So, Medications are effective, and um, you know, really, it's 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 important to let people know what the challenges are, what medications are out there, and and uh, certainly, uh, you that work in in school-based healthcare settings or in school-based settings are are very very well equipped at at being able to manage this within the young people you serve, and I think uh, I think. Here's some um, resources for you. And I didn't leave a lot of time for questions, but I'd certainly like to open it up to questions if anybody has any. So I'll pause here for a few moments. Um, and if anyone has any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box. Here's one from Charlotte Kramer. This is a great question. Do we know how this compares to dopamine release from social media likes and engagement? Wow, that's a terrific, I'll be honest with you, uh, Charlotte, I don't know. But I, I would certainly think that that sort of, you know, having people follow you, getting the recognition, the, the social currency, my guess is that it would have very, very similar effects uh, in terms of dopamine, I wouldn't a dopamine release. I just don't know sort of at what level or how much dopamine would would be released. But that is a terrific question. We know that if if shopping, if shopping causes that, if if gambling causes that, I think sort of um, having people sort of express their pleasure with who you are and and your persona would as well um, increase dopamine release in in an individual's uh, system. Great question. Al, do you have any other questions coming through on your end? I don't see any others coming on through I, on mine. I, I, I don't I don't see any as well. Okay. Okay. Um, so then we're gonna go ahead and move forward. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today. Um, as I mentioned, the slides and the recording of the presentation will be available after the after uh, the webinar today, probably early next week. Um, and I would just like to take a few moments to let everyone know we have an uh, upcoming 
California School-Based Health Conference, our annual conference, which is catered to school-based health professionals, um, school health administration. We will be having some presentations on opioid uh, use and treatment there as well, and so we hope to see you there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.